Sudden death in sport is rare, in young people at least. But these young athletes lose decades of life from diseases that can be diagnosed during life and for which several therapeutic options are available to modify the natural history of disease. It's on this premise that the European Society of Cardiology feel that we should be screening these young individuals to identify those at risk. And in Europe, the ECG is considered the most cost-effective method of detecting young individuals with cardiac disease. Historically, we have used the ESC 2010 recommendations that you've heard about, which divided normal changes into group one that Dr. Gatti has already covered, and changes that, considered, that are considered pathological into group two. These are laudable um, criteria and have been used for many years until the last three to four years. The problem with these criteria is that although they were derived from 33,000 individuals, they were confined to white amateur athletes and did not take into account ethnicity or the fact that some athletes actually pushed themselves well beyond those individuals just going to the gym very slightly. And as a result of this, these criteria have come into disrepute because they're associated with very high false positive rates, as high as 25%. And I'd like to tell you how the international recommendations have come by. Let's analyze these one by one. Let's look at the group two changes and look at T-wave inversion. According to the ESC 2010 recommendations, T-wave inversion requires further investigation. But you've already noted here uh, that adolescent athletes, up to 4% of adolescent athletes under 16, have T-wave inversion. This is, again, work funded by Cardiac Risk and the Young. Around 4% of female athletes have T-wave inversion confined to V1 and V2, which we regard as normal. Around 13% of black athletes have T-wave inversion in leads V1 to V4. And around 14% of endurance athletes, marathon runners, triathletes, Ironman uh, runners, have T-wave inversion in leads V1 to V2. Now you can imagine that if you applied the ESC 2010 recommendations to this group of individuals, we would have a very high false positive rate. I have deliberately put the pictures in of these fellows to show you just how much cardiac risk in the young has contributed to our understanding of the ECG, and each of these fellows have been funded by cardiac risk in the young. The second thing I'd like to talk to you about is this issue of what we define as a short QT interval or a long QT interval. The ESC 2010 recommendations uh, used general criteria, so a QT interval of more than 440 was abnormally long in a male, and more than 460 was abnormally long in a female, and they used a QT interval of 380 uh, or less as a cutoff for short QT. But here, uh, one of my first fellows showed that athletes have longer QT intervals than non-athletes. And we at uh, St. George's felt that a QT closer to 500 milliseconds is what we should use to make a diagnosis of long QT syndrome. Another fellow showed that the cutoff for short QT, this is Harshal Dutia, um, should be closer to 320 milliseconds and not the conventional that we were using. Uh, so 320 or less should be used to de define short QT and not 370 or 380, which was initially used. And based on this, the Seattle criteria were developed. And the Seattle criteria made the following changes. They accepted T-wave inversion in leads V1 to V4 in black athletes as normal, T-wave inversion in all athletes in V1 to V2 as normal, they defined a short QT as a QT of less than 320. A long QT as a QT of more than 470 in men and more than 480 in females. This was based on the 99th uh, centile, so that, that's the cutoff they used. And they also included criteria for RVH 
uh, as normal. So that made a really good difference and reduced false positive rates by 50%, the Seattle criteria did. But at St George's, we still weren't happy because we had these non-specific changes, such as left axis deviation, right axis deviation, left atrial enlargement, right atrial enlargement, and voltage criterion for right ventricular hypertrophy. And these anomalies together are made up for 50% of all the false positive ECG. So there was, still, there was still a lot of work to be done. So um, Dr. Gatti here that presented looked at 14,000 odd individuals and found that axis deviation and atrial enlargement made up 42.6% of all the abnormal ECGs. It was also shown that males, uh, that the athletes had a higher prevalence of these anomalies than non-athletes, particularly those that exercised very hard. And when we investigated these athletes, we didn't find any serious pathology. Excluding axis deviation and atrial enlargement, from, uh, 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 from abnormal, uh, the abnormal category uh, resulted in a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 94%. We also looked at right ventricular hypertrophy, Abbas Saidi here, again published in the European Heart Journal, who showed that ar around 12% of athletes have right ventricular hypertrophy. You can't call that all abnormal. And, so we, and none of these guys had right ventricular pathology, so we considered this as normal. And based on this, we came up with the refined criteria uh, published uh, by, again, by author and Nabil Sheikh. And we, for the first time, included a borderline category. So you had the green that Dr. Gatti has talked to you about, the red that Dr. Sheikh has talked to you about, but we needed a borderline category. And I made the call that axis deviation, atrial enlargement, voltage criterion for uh, right ventricular hypertrophy at that stage, and maybe T-wave inversion in black athletes, because we didn't know enough. Maybe should go in the yellow zone, and if you had one or more of the things in the yellow zone, you automatically go into the red zone, the abnormal zone. If you just had one of these anomalies in the yellow zone, in the absence of symptoms, abnormal physical examination, or family history, you stayed in the green zone. And by doing that, we found that the sensitivity for all conditions, including valvular disease, was only 60%. But when you look specifically for the sensitivity of serious conditions, this went up to 100%. The specificity in white people was 92%. The specificity in black people still only 84% and still needs quite a bit of work. So we don't really know what to do with lateral T-wave inversion or inferior T-wave inversion in black athletes. And more work needs to be done. You will note again that we had considered T-wave inversion beyond V1 as abnormal in these refined criteria. And also, we had included the T-wave inversion in black athletes. We then all met up, uh, an international uh, consensus group from all over the world met up and sat down, and we had the refined criteria as our model, and we wanted to improve things even more. And this is how things stood at the time. So we took ST segment elevation, followed by T-wave inversion in V3 to V4 in black athletes, and we moved it into the normal zone. We took T-wave inversion in adolescent athletes in V1 to V3, aged under 16, and we moved it into the normal zone. If you now focus on the red box right at the top, it says T-wave inversion beyond V1 in white athletes. That's what the refined criteria started as. We wiped that clean, and we replaced that with T-wave inversion beyond V2 in white athletes. The only other thing that we did do, which I was less sure about, was move right bundle branch block from abnormal into the borderline. Now, one study has shown, certainly in endurance athletes, that right bundle branch block may be more common than in general athletes. This is complete right bundle branch block. And this right bundle branch block seems to, be, seems to correlate with right ventricular volumes and maybe a marker of just the size of the right heart. So we've got the complete right bundle branch block now into the borderline zone. So we're left with these international recommendations and I'm really, really proud that it was 17 years of work that was co-published in the European Heart Journal and in JAK. And clearly I am responsible for this. Um, 
sorry, I think wrong picture, the wrong picture, the, the right picture. Um, so, um, clearly, when, when, when someone makes a diagnosis, when someone uses the international recommendations, uh, the question is, well, have they been validated? And what would happen if you applied the international recommendations to a very group, a large group of athletes? And we did just that. Uh, four, nearly 5,000 athletes, 85% men, 85% 85, uh, 85 white, uh, were investigated and the ECG was interpreted according to uh, various criteria, including the international recommendations. We found if you applied the international recommendations, the positive ECG rate was now down to 3%. That's probably acceptable now for even the greatest cynic for screening. If you applied the international recommendations, you reduced the number of people requiring echocardiography by 66%. And that's quite a big deal, if you ask me. But what about the sensitivity and specificity? When you start calling what you used to call abnormal and you start calling it normal, do you actually reduce the sensitivity or specificity of a criterion? And this is a work um, in progress, data on over 11,000 soccer players, all assessed with history, ECG and echocardiography. Serious disease was detected in 0.35%. So if we look at the ESC 2010, which is how we started, going down to Seattle, going down to Refined, going down to International, you will see that the sensitivity has not changed, despite making all these changes. On the other hand, the specificity has increased from 87% to 98%. The positive predictive value of an abnormal ECG has increased from 2.5% to 17%. So we have made real progress on ECG interpretation in athletes, and it, I really would like to thank uh, our fellows, who clearly most, most of them have gone on to do amazing things now, to have contributed so greatly to a very major document, which is probably going to be here to stay for quite a long time. But we should always eat humble pie. There's plenty of scope for improvement. Uh, and my concern really is actually defining which T-wave inversions in black athletes are truly abnormal, because we've got 6% who have T-wave inversion in the inferior leads, 4% of black athletes who have two of inversion in the lateral leads. Indeed, if you combined LVH, mild, mild LVH on the echo with repolarization anomalies consistent with HCM, then 5% of your black athletes would be deemed to have possible HCM. That's unacceptable. If you combined anterior T-wave inversion with an enlarged right ventricular outflow tract, then around 3% of your black athletes would be deemed to have ARVC, again, unacceptable. So more work to be done on the African and Afro-Caribbean ethnic backgrounds. Thank you very much for your attention.